Hello there, Elwyn here. This is part one of Famous Cunning Folk, and to kick us off, I thought, who better than Anne Boswell? <laughs> Meet Anne Boswell, also known as Granny Boswell. A Cornish practitioner, however, not originally from Cornwall. No, Anne was actually born in Ireland and her name was Anne Kingston. She was born in 1813 and she was of Irish and Roma stock. She was brought by her mother to England during the 1840s, and it being the 1840s, it is safe to surmise that the likelihood was because of the Great Potato Famine, which saw so many families uprooted to other countries where they could at least survive, out of sheer desperation. She spent much of her youth at her mother's knee, learning the craft, learning her art, from her mother's mouth to her young ear. She learned the necessities of life, but also that which ancestrally had been passed down to her. As she became a bit older, she worked beside her mother and the older women, clearing weeds and tending fields with sickle, clearing stone and other such jobs. Anne once married. There was rumour that she married beneath herself and for that reason there was some form of scandal. However, that would be only rumour. But what we do know is that her second marriage was one that was true and would last a long time. Anne married a one Ephraim Boswell from a very influential Romany family. They were well admired for their knowledge of horses, wagon building, and their musical talents within their community. The name Boswell even now still holds weight among Romany families. In her forties, Anne gave birth to her first child, which is, would be one of six eventually. The child was born in a tent on Kirkland Road. Anne suffered loss in her life, losing two of her children, and the incarceration of a third must have been a dreadful, dreadful thing. But all survive to be fully grown adults, and of six children, this was a remarkable feat and testament to her knowledge of herbs and cunning, especially that of the wart cunning. It is within her older life and her later years did Anne Boswell be coined the name Granny Boswell. She would often ply her craft to many. Granny Boswell became most reputable in charms, healings and divinations and her counsel was often sought by the local populace. The youngsters would often ask her matters and advices of the hearts and love. There is a rather famous cure that she was known for, for which she would give those suffering with scrofula a small linen bag filled with spiders. They were instructed to hang it from their bedpost, and in time, as the spiders withered and died, so too would their elders. Her husband Ephraim died on the 29th of October in 1904 at the age of 84 years old. It seems that the death of her husband 
only inflamed the radical nature and the rebelliousness of now old Anne Boswell. She would often frequent alehouses, and it was often said that she was almost always drunk when seen there, but doubly so on feast days and celebrations. Yet we all like a drink now and again, I suppose. She made a meagre living plying her craft. It was said she could ill-wish cattle and fowl, and many would give her gifts so as not to evoke her wrath. A remarkable account of Granny Boswell during her more rebellious years as an old widow comes from a discovered memoir of one Captain Taylor. Taylor and his father, a doctor who lived at number one Cross Street, wrote that it was election time in 1906. Granny Boswell was 93 years of age at this point. The Taylors were in their brand new motor car that had been polished for the occasion, ferrying people back and forth to the polling station, trying to get the Tories back in office. Captain Taylor, in his own words, writes, In the 1906 election, we were ferrying voters to the poll. I remember that the polished brass paraffin headlights were adorned with large blue bows. My father had reversed the car across the street outside our house and was about to go forward in the other direction when the local witch walked in front. She stood there, a ragged and grimy old hag, apparently fascinated by the shining and throbbing machine and swaying slightly, as on election day she was more drunk than usual. My father to make her move, first shouted, then roared the engine and tooted the horn. This nettled her, and she shrieked in a broad Irish stroke Cornish accent, and with much foul language that the qualified wagon wasn't going to get as far as the other end of the qualified street. She then turned her back, stalked off in fury, and we started. Before the car was halfway down the street, there was a loud snap, and one of the one-inch steel tension rods broke clean in two. A horse towed us home. The doctor claimed that she lived in luxury. However, this was a fallacy. At the age of 89, she attempted to enter the Helston workhouse, but her case was rejected. She did eventually, after several attempts, find a position in the workhouse. Near the end of her life, for she died the same year as the written account of the broken motor car, 1906, the account said that she would often be seen, wandering, sitting outside on the ledge of a shop window, puffing away on her clay pipe. But in truth, a rather lonely and remarkable figure died in abject poverty. Her body was laid to rest beside that of her husband's, and there the graves remain, well tended and cared for, within the quiet graveyard of Tregarest Methodist Chapel. <laughs>